Well, the main website for this course is the FAS website. Other schools, like the Kennedy School and the Law School, have, will have websites that are supposed to mirror the main website. But I'll look into that and see what we can do to simplify it. All right, any other question? So uh, today I want to introduce the themes, the agenda of our course by addressing three themes. The first theme is the dictatorship of no alternatives that exists in the world. The course is an attempt to address this dictatorship. Uh, then the second theme is the characterization and the explanation of the current disorientation of the progressives or of the left in the world. It is not an exaggeration to say that they are lost. And the third theme is the clarification of the contrast between right and left, and what meaning we should give to, these, to this contrast today. Now, the dictatorship of no alternatives. I want to argue that there is now established in the world a dictatorship of no alternatives, meaning that there is a very restricted repertoire, a menu, of the live options for the organization of different parts of social life. A very restricted list of available institutional setups. And this restricted list is, in a sense, the fate of the contemporary societies. We still use the vocabulary of the past, of ambitious, pretentious words that describe the uh, aspiration to change this or that. But these words are, in a sense, misleading because the reality that we experience is extremely limited. In the rich North Atlantic countries, we have a particular variation, a hollowed out variation, as it turns out, of the social democratic or social liberal settlement of the mid 20th century. And in the rest of the world, the main alternative that is on offer is some variation of authoritarian state capitalism. So this is the reality that we experience. Now, the subject matter of this course is not how can we overthrow this dictatorship of no alternatives. The subject matter of the course is what lies on the other side of this dictatorship? Why would we want to overthrow it if we could? But of course, the outline of the programmatic ideas of ideas about alternatives will require an attempt to relate these conceptions of alternatives to the real interests and the real forces of society. The enemy of the dictatorship of no alternatives is the imagination. The imagination which distances itself, itself from present reality and then subsumes it under a range of possible variation. Not the remote and speculative possible, but the adjacent possible. The next steps to which we can get from here Uh, now, the imagination in our historical experience typically requires an ally. The ally of the imagination is crisis in the form of war, in the form of ruin. Crisis which has typically been the enabling circumstance of change. Without trauma, no transformation. 
Uh, and then the question arises, it is one of the themes of the programmatic discussion, how can we weaken the dependence of change on crisis and create arrangements that allow us to generate alternatives, alternatives to this dictatorship of no alternatives, without paying the price of trauma. In a sense, the task of the imagination is to do the work of crisis without crisis. Now, this discussion, this exploration of alternatives to the dictatorship of no alternatives, takes place in two contexts, approximate context and a remote context. And before I proceed any further, I want to say a word about each of these contexts. So the immediate context, especially in the rich North Atlantic democracies, is the evisceration or the inadequacy of what has been in the recent historical period the major institutional and ideological settlement, the compromise. The last great moment of institutional and ideological refoundation in the history of the advanced societies was this settlement, this compromise, that was prefigured before the Second World War and developed after the war. The social democratic compromise can be understood by a first approximation as a kind of bargain. The forces that threaten to reshape power and production in earlier periods of Western history were made to abandon that attempt. And in return for this abandonment of the attempt to reshape more fundamentally the worlds of power and production, the state was allowed to acquire the power to regulate the economy more intensively to attenuate inequalities generated in the market by deploying retrospective tax and transfer, that is to say progressive taxation and redistributive social spending or entitlements, and to manage the economy countercyclically through fiscal and monetary policy. So the agenda of transformation was drastically narrowed, but the state was given this role to humanize and to stabilize the market order. Now, subsequently in the course of its evolution, as we shall see, this social democratic compromise was hollowed out. And many of its early characteristics were relinquished. It retreated to the last line of defense, which was the maintenance of a high level of redistributive social entitlements, paradoxically financed in large part by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption as in the European social democracies through the comprehensive flat rate value added tax. It was rendered more flexible under the mantra, under the slogan of flexibility of labor markets. A large part of the labor force was consigned to precarious employment, to radical economic insecurity. And this liberalized or somewhat eviscerated form of social democracy, sometimes labeled social liberalism, is then the, the dominant contemporary form 
of this mid-20th century social democratic settlement. Now, it turns out that none of the major problems of the contemporary societies can be adequately solved or even addressed within the limits of the social democratic compromise, even in its liberalized, flexibilized form, the form that we sometimes call social liberalism. And I will now just refer uh, briefly, without elaboration, to three such fundamental problems. So one problem is the hierarchical segmentation of the production system. There is now a new productive vanguard. We sometimes call it the knowledge economy or the innovation economy. It is multi-sectoral. It's not just present in advanced manufacturing. It is present as well in intellectually dense services or even in precision or scientific agriculture. It is present in every part of the production system. However, in each part of the production system, it exists only as a socially exclusive fringe a series of islands, an insular vanguard, excluding the vast majority of workers and of firms. And this insular character of the advanced forms of production then has enormous practical consequences, especially in two domains. First of all, it generates vast inequality. These inequalities are anchored in the actual organization of production. And second, it results in economic slowdown. Now, for example, in the United States today, there is a discourse that goes under the label secular stagnation that tries to make it seem that this economic slowdown, this deacceleration in the rise of productivity, and therefore in the pace of economic growth, is somehow natural. Because supposedly, the contemporary technologies, like artificial intelligence or additive manufacturing, so-called 3D manufacturing, are inherently less revolutionary than the technological innovations of 100 years ago. But this makes no sense. How could anything be more revolutionary in principle than artificial intelligence? So a revolution in the practices and technologies of production that promises profound economic transformation is in fact confined to a series of insular vanguards. And the entrepreneurs and firms that control these vanguards have found a way to make them more insular over time by dividing, by bifurcating the process of production into two parts. A part that can be commoditized or routinized, which they delegate to more regressive firms employing much less wage, well-paid labor in other parts of the world, and the creative and lucrative core which they keep for themselves. So rather than there being a deepening and dissemination of the knowledge economy, turning it into a knowledge economy for the many, rather than what it is, a knowledge economy for the few, we see the opposite happen, a kind of hyper-insularity. Now, that's an example of a problem for which this liberalized social democracy offers no solution. 
And the result, as I say, is both economic slowdown and massive economic inequality anchored in the structural disparities of the production system, the, uh, the deeper and deeper abyss between vanguards and rearguards. Now let me give you an example of a second problem. So the second problem is the practical basis of social cohesion. And I'm thinking now for an example of European social democracy. Uh, so most of these European countries, like most nations in the world, until recently were like tribes. They had a high degree of ethnic, cultural, religious homogeneity. And against that background, it seemed that the orchestration of transfer payments by the state, social entitlements, was an effective social cement. But as the level of ethnic, cultural, religious homogeneity diminish, diminishes, for example, under the pressure of migratory flows, the inadequacy of money as a social cement becomes manifest. So one might think the only adequate basis of social solidarity is direct engagement of people in other people's lives beyond the boundaries of family selfishness. The multiplication of forms of collective action in which people collaborate to achieve shared ends is the real basis of social cohesion. And liberalized social democracy is inadequate to produce it. Now I'll give you an example of a third problem. The third problem is the fundamental problem of politics, transformation. And transformation, especially of what matters most in politics, which is the institutional arrangements. The reallocation of rights and resources from A to B, from one class to another, that's like the waves of the sea coming and going. The only thing that lasts in politics is institutional, the institutional legacy. And it seems that in historical experience, the main enabling circumstance of institutional or structural change has been crisis, especially in the form of war. So that's like the rhythm of European life, when the Europeans are slaughtering one another in the two world wars, and the, they awake, and there are all sorts of transformations happen, and then peace is reestablished, and they go back to sleep and drown their sorrows in consumption. So uh, this is, uh, so then we have to ask, how could we organize a form of political life that would render the impulse to transformation, especially institutional transformation, internal or endogenous? rather than dis depending on this external shock of war to shake things up. Well, it would be a different kind of democracy because all the democracies that exist in the world are in a sense weak democracies. They're based on a low level of political mobilization, of engagement of people in public life. They perpetuate impasse rather than accelerating the pace of politics as well as elevating its temperature, which is the level of political mobilization. And they make it appear that there's some kind of contradiction between strong central initiative, initiative by the central government, and devolution, decentral, decentralized initiative by parts of the country, where, whereas in fact, we could design constitutional arrangements 
that would make central action and devolution complementary. Well, I'm giving you examples of problems that test the limits of this social democratic or social liberal compromise and might lead you to think that to solve their problems, to develop their potential, these societies would have to reopen the terms of the social democratic compromise, which after all, as I said when I defined it, was based on a retreat, a giving up of the attempt more fundamentally to change the institutions in exchange for something else, which was the, the humanization of the market order. So the inadequacy of social democracy or of social liberalism manifests itself in the political life of these societies through uh, the failure of the center-right and of the center-left parties and the rise of populism, especially right-wing or plutocratic populism, which then comes and attempts to fill this vacuum the working class majority of these countries in the United States, the white working class majority, feels dispossessed or betrayed. And then the right wing populace arises to appeal to them and to profit politically from this experience of dispossession. But right wing populism doesn't really have an institutional program of its own other than limits on immigration or strengthening of executive authority. So rather than replacing the vacuum by a project, it seems to perpetuate the vacuum. So that's then a description of where we are today. So that's the immediate context in which this discussion about the overthrow of the dictatorship of no alternatives takes place. Now let me describe the remote context, because this immediate context is enveloped within a larger story. And I'll now say a few words about this larger story. So for about 300 years now, the world has been set on fire by a revolutionary project. This revolutionary project has had two sides. One side has been political, and it has been carried by the doctrines of democracy, of liberalism, of socialism, promising to lift the grid of entrenched social division and hierarchy that weighs on social life, the promise of emancipation. And the second side of this revolutionary project has been romanticism. Not just the high romanticism of the 19th century, but the worldwide popular romantic culture carried by music, by soap operas, by films, bringing into every slum and every village in the world the message that the ordinary man and woman is not so ordinary after all, and that he or she can ascend to a higher form of life and become more human by becoming more godlike. Uh, this is the personalist side of this world revolutionary project. Uh, now, this, this project is, not the, is far from being the only project of the world. In the world, it has many enemies. But all of its enemies respond to it. It has continued to command the agenda to which everyone else responds or reacts. 
And it is now in the characteristic situation of being both strong and weak. It is strong because its votaries, it's beca because it, it continues to command the agenda, but it's weak because its, its votaries, its adepts, no longer know what its next step should be on either the political side or the personalist side. And if you don't know what the next steps of a project are, you can't keep the project alive. The law of the spirit is that we can possess only what we renounce and, re and, and reinvent. So the subject matter of our discussion here is the reinvention of this world revolutionary project on its political side. So we have a problem now, a very particular problem. Our problem is that our lives seem to have fallen in what I hope will be a counter-revolutionary interlude in this long revolutionary period in the history of humanity. And the question for each individual then is, will he allow his, his actions, his deeds, and his thoughts to be shaped by the biases of the counter-revolutionary interlude. Now, for myself, I am determined that they will not be. And, and of course, by calling it an interlude, I'm expressing the hope that this revolutionary project will continue in a different form. Now, I know that it can continue in the form it had before. It has to have a different content. It has to have a different method. In order to live, we have to reinvent it. So that's the larger context. The immediate context is what lies beyond the default position of the contemporary progressives, which is institutionally conservative social democracy. And the larger question is, how can we make the world revolutionary project this project that, as I say, has aroused, inflamed the whole world for 300 years, how can we make it continue? Uh, that's the program. Uh, now, to, to give you a sense of the difficulty of anyone who takes seriously this attempt today to resist the dictatorship of no alternatives and think beyond its limits, I want to describe the embarrassments faced by anyone who today attempts to think and argue programmatically about alternatives in the world. So I present to you a set of alternatives, of institutional alternatives, and if they're very far from what exists today in a particular society, you're likely to say, well, that's very interesting, but it's utopian. And if the alternatives are close to what exists, then you're likely to say, well, it's certainly feasible, but it's trivial. So almost anything that can be proposed in the present climate of opinion in the world is likely to be dismissed as either trivial or utopian. Now, the first thing to say about this circumstance that I've described is that it results from a misunderstanding of the nature of a programmatic argument or of transformative practice. It's not about blueprints. It's about sequences. It's a succession of steps. And so, in a sense, it's not like architecture. It's like music. Uh, 
And any trajectory of transformation that is worth thinking about can be described at points that are relatively close or relatively far away from what exists now. What there are two things that matter most in a programmatic argument. First of all, the definition of the direction. And second, the initial steps by which, in a particular historical circumstance, in a particular society, to begin moving in that direction. But this confusion, which I've just described about the nature of a programmatic argument, is greatly aggravated in our circumstance by the poisonous legacy of ideas. The confusion of ideas. So we now have no credible way of thinking about structural change. The established social sciences and social theory offer us no way to think about structural change. So the most influential set of ideas that guided the left, the progressives, were Marxism. But the truth is that Marxism depends on a series of heroic, extreme, necessitarian assumptions about society and its transformation that almost no one believes in and that have been discredited by both historical experience and our own contemporary experience. Uh, so people continue to use the vocabulary, but the vocabulary emptied of the sense that it had when it was based on the particular social theoretical assumptions on, the, on those ideas. So because we have no credible way of thinking about structural change, we fall back on a false, a bastardized criterion of political realism. That something is realistic if, if it's close to what already exists. Well, that's ridiculous. That's not a criterion of political realism. That's just like a kind of declaration of intellectual bankruptcy. We don't know how to think about transformation, about structural transformation. So the fake proxy for an idea of transformation is that it's realistic if it's close to what now exists, and it's not realistic if it's not close to what now exists. But that's not really a, uh, that's not a way of thinking about transformation. That's a substitute for the way of thinking about transformation that we don't have. So that helps explain the severity of this dilemma that I just described. Now, in the arguments of this course, in general, my emphasis will be on describing alternatives that are neither very close to what now exists in the contemporary societies, nor very far away, but, if you like, at some middle distance. And the reason for that is that in an academic setting like this one, when our priority is conceptual clarification, the middle distance is very convenient. It serves the purposes of clarification. But it has a great defect in practical politics, in transformative practice, and in the language of programmatic persuasion. So in transformative practice, our tendency will be to discard the middle distance and to combine the two extremes. Because the proposals at the middle distance, which is the level at which I will operate most of the time in the arguments here of the course, have the disadvantage of seeming to be too far away from the present reality to be readily capable of implementation, 
but not far away enough to arouse enthusiasm. And that is why, in the practice of transformative politics, we ordinarily attempt to combine the very practical or immediate with the prophetic. The language of transformative politics must be at the same time practical and prophetic, and it must then subordinate this middle distance. Now, I say that so that you can correct for the emphasis here, because you have to understand that this, these, are, these are the discussions of a trajectory which can be always described at points that are relatively close to what exists or much further away. Now, against that background, then, let me describe the basic plan of the course, which is really very simple. So first, I want to describe in two contemporary circumstances the position of the progressives. And what's the default position? The default position, as I say, is social liberalism, social democracy. And I'm going to choose two contemporary national contexts. One is the United States, and the other is European social democracy. The default position of the progressives in general in the world today is some version of social democracy. Most of the American progressives seem that, that they would like the United States to be like the Sweden of 1970. Not the real Sweden of 1970. It's what they imagined the Sweden of 1970 was. Uh, so, that's the default position of the progressives. So we have to understand that position in its national context. And then I want to argue why it's inadequate and what lies beyond it. Then we're going to focus on three large substantive themes. The first theme is the democratization of the market order. Not the regulation of the market, not the attenuation of market inequalities by retrospective tax and transfer, but the reshaping of the institutional and legal architecture of the market, actually to reinvent it, its form, its structure. And with the hope then that by reinventing it in this way, we would shape what is most important with respect to equality, which is the primary distribution of access to economic and educational advantage. The tendency of institutionally conservative social democracies to say, the market is a great motor and instrument for the creation of wealth. But unfortunately, it produces these inequalities. So we come after the fact, and then, then we correct what the market has done. Now, it turns out that this after-the-fact correction is, by its very nature, extremely limited. Because if it, it cannot effectively deal with massive inequalities. With a, it, 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 it would have to be an equally massive. It would have to reach such a dimension of redistribution that would begin to disturb and derange the established economic arrangements and incentives and to exact an unacceptable cost. And that's why we might want to reinvent the market step by step rather than simply to humanize it through retrospective redistribution influencing, as I say, the initial distribution of advantage rather than attempting to create a secondary or derivative corrected distribution. 
Now, that formulation of the idea could give you the sense that, well, it's just a radical thing, this was, uh, which then would require a revolutionary change in society. But I want to return to my point. The most structural or institutional change is piecemeal, fragmentary. The idea of the total substitution of the system is a largely fantastical limiting case. So the fact that it is institutional or structural doesn't mean that it happens all of a sudden. It happens piecemeal in successive steps, but it has a different focus. So that's the first theme. And in that first theme, we're then going to discuss the relation of the advanced parts of production to the backward parts of production, or the vanguards to the rear guards. This is what I was calling the hierarchical segmentation of the production system. The relation of finance to the real economy and to the productive agenda of society. Does finance serve the productive agenda of society or does it use the transactions of the real economy as a pretext to serve itself? And the relation of labor to capital. Now in this age of the insular knowledge economy, an increasing part of the labor force is consigned to precarious employment, as I said before. Under what conditions can free work become really free? What is the short-term and the long-term response to this problem of the evolution of technology in a way that replaces labor rather than enhancing it. The second theme is the deepening of democracy, the creation of high energy democracies that weaken the dependence of change on crisis and render the impulse to transformation endogenous or internal to social life. And the third theme is the creation of the individual who has the capabilities and the safeguards to prosper, to act, to stand up in the midst of a storm of change and innovation all around him. And one important element of that is the nature of the education that that individual should receive. Then at the end of the course, so the first part are these two contexts, United States and the European Union. The second part are these focal points, these themes of democratizing the market, deepening democracy, and empowering the individual. And in the third part, then, I want to come back to the ideas about the way to think about structural change, what I said was missing, and the normative direction. Now, that's so much for the discussion of the dictatorship of no alternative and the plan of the course. Now I come to the second topic that I wanted to address today, which is the disorientation of the progressives or of the left. Let's leave open for the moment the question of this vocabulary of left or progressive. Leave it undefined, to define it little by little. How are we to understand this disorientation? So let's, the first problem is there's no clear program. The progressives or the left, the contemporary left, has no clear program. The program used to be the state control, the state direction of the economy. 
And what's the alternative to that? The alternative seems to be simply this corrective redistribution. So the institutionally conservative social democrats, having lost faith in the state control of production or state guidance of the economy, then retreat to this role of sugarcoating the program of their conservative adversary. So they appear then on the stage of contemporary history as the humanizers of the inevitable. Their task is to put a human face on the program of their conservative adversary. So you ask, what is their program? Their program is the conservative program. But with this humanizing gloss, which comes afterwards through retrospective tax and transfer. Um, now, what do, they, what do they lack? So one thing they lack is they have no productivist project, no progressive approach to the supply side of the economy. So the progressive approach to the supply side of the economy used to be the state control of production. But now there's no progressive approach to the supply side of the economy on the whole. So the project, rather than being a productivist project, then becomes a redistributivist project. There is an asymmetry between production and redistribution. So a productivist project is inevitably structural. It involves structural change, institutional change. But a redistributive project, if its focus is on this secondary distribution created by compensatory transfers, is not necessarily structural at all. And precisely because it's not structural, it's likely to be inadequate to deal with inequalities that are rooted in the structural disparities of the economy. So then there's this confusion. Uh, what is their aim? Is it their aim to re reorganize the society and the economy? Or is it their aim simply to humanize it after the fact? Now, the second source of the disorientation has to do with the way of thinking. I mentioned before, the dominant intellectual, social theoretical influence on the left or on the progressives worldwide has been Marxism. Marx's theory of society and history was a theory of structural change. And at its core is a revolutionary insight that the structures of society are not like natural phenomena. We made them. There are creation, there are artifacts, and they can be changed. But the revolutionary insight that is central to this way of thinking is surrounded by a host of illusions that compromise its its truth and its efficacy. So what are these illusions? So the first illusion is that there is a closed list of regimes, Marx called them the modes of production, uh, in history. And uh, these regimes are then are enacted through the logic of class conflict, one after another. The second illusion is that each of these regimes is an indivisible system. So it's either managed, that's reformism, or it's replaced, that's revolution. So the direct consequence of this second illusion, the indivisibility idea, is a binary view of politics. There's either the reformist management or the revolutionary substitution. Now, I think it's clear that this binary idea is 
completely false. Uh, then total change almost never happens. It's this kind of limiting case. And structural change, when it happens, characteristically happens in a piecemeal, fragmentary form. So we, we, we have to reject this binary idea of politics and say, uh, an agenda of alternatives should be about radical reforms. And what are radical reforms? They are reforms that are structural or institutional, but that are characteristically piecemeal and that are likely to be implemented experimentally or gradually or cumulatively. They can become revolutionary in outcome if they persist in a certain direction. So a way of summarizing the basic source of the intellectual confusion or disorientation is this. Classical European social theory, as exemplified by Marxism, did, did present us with a way of thinking and talking about structure. But it is a way that we now have trouble believing. On the other hand, the contemporary social sciences and policy <coughs> discourse have disposed of these illusions only by rejecting any attempt to have a theory of regimes, of structures, and of how they change. So the tendency is to think of the regimes as an extension of the way as, that we think of what goes on within them. So we begin to think of them as the residue of many acts of interest balancing, of compromise, we have no theory of how these regimes are created and of how they change. So the, the light has failed. Now, someone who wants to maintain the status quo doesn't need a theory of regimes. But anyone who, is, who has set out to change the structure of the society and the economy must have a theory and cannot dispense with this light of the ideas. So that's the second source of the confusion, of the disorientation. Now, the third source is the lack of a credible social base. So for the left parties in Western history, the, the core social base was the organized industrial labor force headquartered in the capital-intensive sectors of the economy, and especially in mass production industry, we call Fordist industry, the large-scale production of standardized goods and services with rigid machines and production processes on the basis of semi-skilled labor in very hierarchical and very specialized relations of production, the technical division of labor. That constituency was the base. Now there's this problem. That historical constituency has become a shrinking minority of the population all over the world. So the organized industrial labor force which for the most part, by the way, is no longer organized at all in a sense of being unionized, comes to be seen and ultimately to see itself as just one more special interest in society and not as the representative of the universal interest of society and especially of the majority. And what has replaced the organized working class? Now, I want to make this, this claim, and it's a polemical claim, that the majority of humanity now has a 
petty bourgeois horizon, to use the Marxist category. So it, most people in the world, most workers in the world of any kind in any society, from the rich societies to the poor societies, are in small enterprises or are working individually disconnected from enterprises. They are not the small business class objectively, but they are the small business class subjectively, meaning that what they aspire to is a modest economic prosperity and independence. Now, the only visible way of satisfying this impulse in many societies the default ideal is traditional, <coughs> isolated, archaic family business. To have a small plot of land, to have a store, to have a little enterprise. Not because that's the only way in which this aspiration could be solved, but because that's the only way that is visible and accessible. So the petty bourgeois aspiration, now interpreted subjectively, is the default target of this desire of the majority. Now the left, especially the Western left, has always had a problem with the small business class, with the petty bourgeoisie. In Europe, in the 20th century, it demonized the petty bourgeoisie. The petty bourgeoisie was the enemy. And it then became, having been demonized by the left, the basis of the radical right-wing movements, of fascism, of, of Nazism. But now, if to go back to what I was just saying, if we, if the problem is that the petty bourgeois defined subjectively is now the majority of humanity. So what, is, what are they going to do about that? They have to come to terms with this reality. They have to meet this aspiration on its own terms and reshape it or redirect it in some way. Now, the fourth source, source of the disorientation is the absence of a crisis of adequate dimension. So in the 20th century, there were the two world wars. They shook everything up. They led to the collapse of empires, the revolt of states all over the world, of enslaved peoples, of peoples in these empires. Uh, they created a basis for social revolution in the in the belligerent countries, everything changed. Uh, but now we are in a period in which these total wars seem inconceivable. And the other major crisis was the collapse of the economy, right? the, the depression of the 1930s between those two wars. Now we found ways of managing the economy counter-cyclically to manage or level out these radical economic changes. So we don't have, we don't have crisis as the indispensable ally of change. So that's the fourth difficulty. So add up all those difficulties and they help explain why they are now disoriented, the, left, the leftists, the progressives, and why their tendency overall has been to retreat to this role of sugarcoating, of becoming the humanizers of the inevitable. Now, there's one final theme that I wanted to address in this introductory class. And that's the relation between the right and the left, or how we are to interpret this contrast. Now, many people now believe 
that this distinction no longer makes sense and that these words have lost any usable meaning. I think that we have an interest in retaining this contrast, but that we can retain it only by giving it a completely different <coughs> meaning. And that's what I want to try, and that's the argument that I want to try and sketch now. So let's begin with the conventional shape of the ideological debate such as it exists in the world today. So in the conventional sense, what does it mean to be a conservative or a progressive, a rightist or a leftist? So the meaning seems to be that the leftists are those who prioritize equality against the background of the established institutional arrangements institutionally conservative social democracy or social liberalism. And the rightists, the conservatives, are those who prioritize freedom against the same background. So the shape of the ideological conflict is that it's a contest between shallow equality and shallow freedom. If by shallowness we mean the acceptance of the established institutional presupposition. Now, what would be the alternative? So you could say, um, let's imagine that the leftists want deep equality. What would deep equality? We would lift the, re the restrictions that the institutional order establishes the, the restraints on a, a, a great equality of outcomes, of circumstances. So there would have to be radical redistribution. So every time there was economic accumulation over a certain level, we canceled it out. And that would be the supreme objective. We might be, become much poorer, but we would be equal. We would be like the the myth, the image of the ancient Spartans or the ancient Romans. We would be poor but equal. Now, who wants that? It seems that that's not an objective that anyone in the world really seeks and is not an adequate account of the historical aims of the progressives. So the alternative proposal, to use the same vocabulary, is that the true aim of the progressives or of the leftists is not deep equality, it's deep freedom. And by deep freedom, I mean the rise of the ordinary man and woman of the life of the ordinary man and woman to greater scope, greater intensity, greater capability. That this ex fundamental experience of agency and the enhancement of agency be generalized. So this suggestion that we should imagine the, the distinction between the right and the left to be about a shared bigness we can then develop in the following way. We could say we have to distinguish the goal or the value, the direction, from the method. So first on the goal. What is one way of thinking about the distinction between right and left, conservative and progressive? It's the way they answer the question is it natural for human life to be small? So the conservative would be the person who says, yes, it is natural for human life to be small. And there will always be an elite of geniuses, of entrepreneurs, of innovators, of creators. But for most of the time, human life will be small. Life will be a long littleness. 
And the only exception will be these periods of emergency, like war, in which people will be lifted out of the rut of their small concerns into this larger world of collective devotion. Now, I think this communicates with the way in which the progressives, the liberals, and the socialists thought about their objectives in the 19th century. So John Stuart Mill or Karl Marx. The ultimate objective of the progressives on this view was not the humanization of society. It was the divinization of humanity. And the, the diminishment of inequality, to be sure, was part of their objective because an extreme and entrenched inequality was incompatible with this idea of everyone becoming bigger together. The right, the conservatives, were those who think that there is this natural hierarchy in society and that only some can become bigger. So we formulate this now. The, the vision that those 19th century liberals had, and, or socialists had, of what it meant to become bigger was too narrowly framed on an aristocratic idea of self-possession. So we, we would have to have a larger, more magnanimous, more contradictory idea of what bigness is and how it can be manifest. But this would then be the, the definition of the goal. And then what is the other distinction between right and left on this view, which I'm saying replaces the view that it's like just a contest between shallow equality and shallow freedom? The conservatives are those who believe that the interests of society, the ideals and interests of society, must be pursued within the horizon of the established institutional arrangements. And the leftists or progressives are those who believe that no, none of these ideals and interests can be adequately realized within that horizon, that they all require a transgression of this frontier. Now, the way of transgressing the frontier has to be distinct from this binary view of politics, that there's a radical substitution of the system, because there are, there are no, there aren't these indivisible systems. But there's still the, the, the issue of whether we proceed beyond the frontier of the established institutions. So now I can summarize this proposal. What then defines a leftist by contrast to a rightist, a progressive by contrast to a conservative? The leftist is the one who says, it's not natural for human life to be small. We can become bigger, provided that we become bigger together. Uh, and he is also the one who says that these interests and ideals have to be satisfied by going beyond the boundary of the established institutional arrangements. And that would then be lead to a different definition. Now, there's, of course, a problem with the application of this definition, which is that if, if I apply this definition to the contemporary progressives, I will be required to classify almost all of them as conservatives. And uh, the, because there'll be no one left on the other side, or very few. Uh, and, but is, is that a problem or an opportunity? Well. Uh, that's all I wanted to say by way of introducing the course, and now I'm open to your, to your comments and questions. It's always hard to engage at the outset, but uh, you can address any aspect of, of, this, of this argument. Yes. 
an enabling condition of change more than just a lubricant. Well, but what I thought of as crises were really these crises of very large dimension. So it's not like we don't have wars or we don't have depressions or something like that, but they're nothing like the wars and depressions of the 20th century, uh, and which were, they were formidable. I mean, look at the United States. Franklin Roosevelt was uh, an experimentalist reformer. And he had, as his allies, the greatest war in the history of the world and the greatest economic collapse that the modern world had experienced. And even then he had trouble because the, the system in which he was operating was organized to give him trouble. Uh, so I think... Uh, it's not a council of despair, but, but what it was meant to suggest is that one of the attributes of the institutions that we might want to design, the economic and the political institutions, is that they weaken this dependence of change on crisis. And they render the impulse to transformation internal to social life, so that we would not need crisis as the condition of change. So what would that mean, for example, in the way of organizing a democracy? What it would mean would be we might want, as I said, a higher temperature of democracy because only a high temperature democracy can have rich structural content would be my thesis. And that meaning that so the, 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 the level of organized popular engagement in political life higher the pace of politics accelerated. Uh, so if there's an impasse, the impasse should be resolved quickly. The point is like Popper, Karl Popper said of science, the purpose is to make mistakes as quickly as possible and, and to, to accelerate the pace. And then to think strong central initiatives should be possible, but Parts of a, a, a society, of a country, under certain conditions, should be able to depart, to deviate from the general solutions. And that's radical devolution. So that as a society goes down a certain road, it hedges its bets by allowing parts of itself to generate counter models of the national future. So I would say, well, that's a political example of a way of organizing democracy that diminishes the dependence of change on crisis. So we don't need crisis as this exogenous shock to hit us over the head and, and, and we, we, we organize our political life so that it facilitates its own revision. Uh, uh, that that's would be one way of addressing the absence of, of, of crisis in, in, in adequate dimension. So, and now, now you could generalize this in the form of a philosophical conception, which is more than just an argument about politics. You could say there are two categories of moves that we make in the world. There are the routine moves that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we take for granted. And then the, there are the extraordinary moves by which from time to time we change pieces of the framework, typically under the pressure or provocation of crisis. Now, what might we want? We might want to narrow the distance between these two sets of moves so that the activity of changing parts of the framework arose more continuously or organically from our normal moves within the framework rather than being some kind of interruption of the normal flow of social life. 
and then we would be greater and freer. We would be more empowered. That would be the, gen that would be the generalized form of the same idea that I just expressed through the conception of a high energy democracy. Yes. Well, I, I think that there are a series of mystifications or illusions that we have to face in every part. So let's take this example of political life, because we're using uh, now the example of the, of the organization of democracy. So conservative political science and conservative statecraft has as one of its assumptions that there is a tension, if not a contradiction, between mobilization popular mobilization and institutionalization. So politics, let me state the idea in a, uh, in a punchier form. So the idea is that politics must either be cold and institutional or it must, can be hot and anti or extra institutional as in Caesarism and so forth. So at the end of the day, we have to choose between Madison and Mussolini. That's the conservative idea. Now, I think that idea is false because different political institutions differ in the extent to which they raise the temperature of politics. The rules of politics, the, the rules of political action can be framed so that cumulatively, they increase the level of political mobilization. So for example, in the United States, the Americans are thought to be relatively unpolitical and so forth. So give me a rule in the United States of that you can't buy television time. The, the access to the television is distributed for free to the political parties and organized social movements as a condition of uh, the revocable licenses under which they do their business. Then say that you have in the United States, for example, a rule of mandatory voting. Only half of the American electorate votes. In many, in many democracies in the world, both rich and poor, the vote is mandatory. And everyone has to vote. And if you don't vote, you pay a fine. It's not. And no country that has adopted a rule of mandatory voting has ever later revoked it. So it's be when it's been adopted, it's, it's, it's then gone on to help shape the political culture. So what I'm saying is that something that is supposed to be intrinsic or cultural or natural to the Americans is in fact the, the outcome of a series of arrangements. And that if you change all these arrangements in the direction that I'm describing, the temperature of organized political engagement in the United States would increase dramatically. So that's what I mean by high temperature. And then, now, the second presupposition of conservative political science or, or statecraft is, has to do with the relation between uh, the division of power in the democratic state and the, the encouragement to impasse. So in the American constitutional arrangements, 
there are two principles. There's a liberal principle of the fragmentation of power. And there's a conservative principle of the slowing down of politics through Madison's scheme of checks and balances. The Americans think that these two principles, the conservative principle and the liberal principle, are naturally and necessarily combined. I believe that they're mistaken and that, that they're not naturally and necessarily combined. They're combined by design, by intention. And a large part of the original intention was to inhibit the political transformation of society. Huh? And it would be relatively easy to invent constitutional mechanisms that would allow you to retain the liberal principle but to repudiate the conservative one. For example, you could say that whenever there was an impasse between the Congress and the executive, on a major programmatic matter. Either political branch could call for early election to resolve the impasse. But the, early, but the branch that called the early elections would always have to run for office itself. So in other words, if the Congress called the early election, the Congress would have to also go to the electorate. So, so the branch that exercised the constitutional prerogative would have to pay the political price of running the electoral risk. Any simple change like that would radically alter the political logic of the system and would transform the presidential regime from being an instrument of the perpetuation of impasse to being a way of accelerating politics. Now take a third example. Uh, uh, federalism. So you know from the Federalist Papers onward, the states in the United States are supposed to be uh, laboratories of experimentation. But classical federalism is anti-experimentalist by its rigid division of powers. So you can imagine two stages in the evolution of federalism, of an experimentalist federalism. In one, you promote cooperative federalism, horizontally among the states and among the municipalities and vertically among the levels of the federation. And then in the second stage, you say that under certain conditions, one state or one municipality can apply for a right for very wide divergence. It wants to try out something completely different. Now, this could be an instrument of persecution, of the entrenchment of privilege, so it would have to be vetted judicially and politically. But there is no contradiction between strong central initiative and radical devolution. It all depends on how you design the arrangement. So I'm giving you this example. So, w of, of how, so first of all, it's an example of how relatively small institutional changes can have drastic consequences. And secondly, it's, it's an example of how the rationalization of the established order depends on a series of mystifications, on the claim that there are contradictions which are insoluble. But they're not insoluble. They're soluble by specific initiatives of institutional innovation. And now, if you imagine this method that I've just exemplified here in our exchange, generalized to all of, so all of society, you can see how everything begins to move. Now, of course, that's not how real change takes place. Real change takes place because there's a direction, right? So, and it's, it's not just a collection of, of uh, a, a heap of disconnected things. So the technocrat, the policy expert, thinks that it's just one practical problem after another. The answer to that was given by a remark that was made about Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. He said, all of Roosevelt's programs failed, but the New Deal as a whole was a success. Now, how is that possible? It's because a real transformation in history it's not a collection of technical solutions to discrete problems. It's like a waterfall. It's a current. 
that's going in a particular direction. And it generates many practical experiments, almost all of which are flawed. And they, they, they replace one another in rapid succession. And it doesn't matter. What matters is that they keep moving in a particular direction. So that's, that's the spirit in which I want to propose to develop the argument. Yes. Um, I suppose uh, before saying there's a way of answering the same radical outcomes. Yes. Uh, radical saying is often a secular dialogue in traditional systems like constitutions, which you could argue makes some types of procedural sayings more realistic for truth than others. For example, economic sayings over electoral campaign sayings. Um, what would you suggest in such rule when procedural sayings get to be constitutional roadblocks? Well, that's the whole point, right? I mean, you, you, so change will always be perceived by a logic of combined and uneven development. So, you, so the Marxist idea, the classical social theoretical idea, is it's all a system. But it's not all a system. A real structure in history is composed by many arrangements that on the whole reinforce one another but they are not literally inseparable from one another. So then you begin, you choose to begin in what the circumstances allow. Uh, uh, and then you discover that you can advance in a certain direction. For example, you can advance in changing the economic institutions, but you ultimately confront a limit of the political institutions, as you just suggested. So that's, but is, is that the problem or is that the solution? So, so, so you, you, any change in the established order is always going to have this characteristic that you are, you're going to proceed on a certain front and then you're going to hit against these limits until you change something else. And, and every change is going to have this amb ambiguity that it is both an initial step in some further succession of steps, and it's a reason not to change further. So, so the meaning of every political experiment is given by what comes next, by its sequel, and the sequel is not predetermined. So that's, that's, the, real, that's the real ambiguity of historical experience. Yes. 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 Well, I appreciate your allusion to vitality because it seems to me that the most important attribute of these contemporary societies is their vitality. So uh, what is the tragedy of these societies like the United States or my country, Brazil? It's that there's this vast human energy, this movement, this aspiration. And most of the part, and most of this human energy comes to nothing. It's, it's, it, for, for lack of instruments and of opportunity. Huh? So this is, this is the tragedy. So all this genius, all this innovation goes to the grave without having discovered itself. Uh, so that's this idea that, that we become bigger together. Uh, that's the, the, the classical idea that we become more human by becoming more godlike. Not godlike in the sense of omnipotence or omniscience, but godlike in the sense of transcendence. So implicit in all of this 
is uh, a metaphysical and religious conception. We're shaped by the context, the social and conceptual worlds that we build and inhabit, but there's always more in us than there is in them. So we spill over. Uh, and we, there's this residue of transgression of possibility. And what then are the institutions that we desire? They're the institutions that recognize this power of transcendence and that nurture it, that, that develop it. That's what it means to become bigger. So we then create, in, we then create arrangements that achieve this possibility. Huh? So we've been speaking about politics, but the same thing arises in economics and in the relation of technology to human labor. So, um, and in the way we think about the relation between the self and the machine. So what is a machine? A machine is the, we, the expression of what we have learned how to repeat. So everything that we've learned how to repeat, we can express in a formula or an algorithm. And then we can embody the formula or the algorithm in a mechanical device, the machine. So what then is the point of the machine? The point of the machine is to do for us what we have already learned how to repeat so that we can preserve our supreme and in a, and in a sense our only resource, our time, for the not yet repeatable. And so then the relation between the worker and the machine, the worker is the anti-machine and the machine is in principle immensely more powerful than either of them alone. Now, then we think of the evolution of technology. So technology has no intrinsic direction, its evolution. And so it will always imply some substitution of labor. But the extent to which it develops in a way that enhances labor rather than just substituting it is open. So we would want then to shape it so that it enhances labor. And we would, in principle, want an economy in which no one is required to do the work that could be done by a machine. Because for a human being to be free, to be bigger, a human being should not work as if he were one of his machines. So in Henry Ford's assembly line or in Adam Smith's pin factory, the worker worked as if he were one of his machines uh, through repetitious movements that mimic the movements of the lathe of the metal cutting devices with which he worked. That's what we don't want. We want the, the, to affirm this, this contrast between the imagination and the machine. And uh, now, to pursue the economic matter. Uh, in the 19th century, up to the middle of the 19th century, the universal belief of the liberals and the socialists was that wage labor was a def defective and inferior form of free labor. The higher, f there are three forms of free labor. Wage labor, self-employment and cooperation. So the orthodox belief up to the middle of the 19th century was that wage labor should give way over time to the higher forms of free labor, self-employment and cooperation. Because wage labor retained many of the features of serfdom and slavery and was incompatible with emancipation. In the 19th century, the liberals and the socialists were unable to resolve a practical problem. The practical problem was how the predominance of self-employment and cooperation could be reconciled with the practical imperative 
of the aggregation of resources at scale. Uh, and so that the solution to that problem would require a reinvention of property rights uh, to show how independent self-employed workers or cooperators could nevertheless have access to resources at scale. We would have to experiment with the ways of making claims on the productive assets of society. So answers to questions like these are faithful for the future of society because that's the, 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 the spirit, our freedom, our, our enhancement of agency depends on the accumulation of these institutional details. The spirit is nailed to the cross, it's crucified. And, and we, we, to address its condition, we have to reshape society. That's what I'm proposing as the core belief of the progressive. Combining the ideal, the aim of becoming bigger together, with the aim of altering the institutional arrangements of society. Yes? I, it's, I don't have any metric for it. I mean, uh, it's uh, a crisis that is sufficient to take people out of their uh, out of their routines, out of their littleness, uh, and shake things up. And that was the characteristic of the worldwide depression of the war. And by the way, it wasn't just. Uh, uh, just about the solution of political or economic problems. So it was a profound revelation of who we are. So uh, in the Second World War, you, I don't know whether you know this fact, but in the Second World War, the r rates of suicide and depression fell precipitously in all of the belligerent powers. So in the Soviet Union, in Russia, 22, 23 million people died. Unbelievable horror. Now, in this terrible event, how could it be that precisely then people stopped killing, killing themselves uh, or stopped being depressed? Then when universal peace was reestablished, the rates of suicide and depression came back up. So what does that tell us about who we are? So it seems to be that when people were required to forget about themselves, about their sorrows, and drawn up into some great collective conflict, they were happier, even in the midst of terrible suffering. So our idea of the humanity for which we are developing these institutions has to take into account that human reality of who we are. Uh, are we satisfied with this littleness or not? And if we're, and uh, so this story, like I just told you about, about the war, is part of the material that we have to take into account. Yes. Louder, please. I'm not sure I understood. 
yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, so an economy, so an economy of independent proprietors of self-employed workers or cooperators seem to be incompatible with an idea of aggregation of resources at scale. Uh, and we have to imagine experiments in the development of access to productive resources and opportunities. So the market does not have a natural form. Uh, the market is a system of decentralization. And the question is, on what terms will people have access to productive resources and opportunities? So in another course that I was teaching here, I gave this example. Imagine the thought experiment. Now thinking, it's not approximate change, thinking far into the future, a radical alternative. Imagine that all the productive assets of society are vested in independent trusts. It's not the government allocation of resources. There are independent trusts. And there are, there's a rotating capital auction. So whoever is able to assure the trust of the highest rate of return for the use of the productive resources is able to bid those resources away. So we say no one has control of the major productive assets of society permanently or absolutely, but only conditionally. And so we have this idea that all the claims on the productive resources are temporary, fragmentary, and conditional, rather than the absolute unified property right, absolute in time as well as in scope. And so but that's the extreme form of a development that would have to begin much earlier. So we would still want there to be a a place in the organization of the market for traditional unified absolute property because the advantage of traditional the traditional property right is that it allows the asset holder to do something that no one else believes in and there would always be room for that but what we would say is the market should not be fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself Alternative regimes of property and contract should coexist experimentally within the same market order. Now, that's doing what I promised earlier in the class that I wouldn't do, because I said I would describe the alternatives at a middle level of distance from the current arrangement. And that's certainly not at a middle level of distance. That's far away, but, I, but I'm evoking the direction. So what I'm saying is that the nature of a free economy and of a free politics, of a democracy and of a market economy are not predetermined. And the most important feature of the alternatives that we would require is that they invite their own revision. And that not just that they be experiments, but that they be experiments that help organize a continuing experimental activity about the institutions of social life, an ongoing experiment, in order to narrow the distance that I describe between those two categories of moves, the moves that we make within a framework and the moves that we make about the framework. Yes. Well, why would we expect the vanguard to be contingent? You mean the vanguard, as in my example of the knowledge economy, the knowledge economy in the United States being being insular. Yeah. Huh? So, uh, this is one of the fundamental problems in a, in a country like the United States. The United States is the seat uh, 
of this technological innovation, but it exists only in the form of these fringes. Huh? So spatially and socially. So you could ask spatially the question, why is there no knowledge economy in, in North Dakota? So uh, why is it there in Silicon Valley? And so you might think that the vanguard would then have set its mark on the whole economy. And because after all, industrial mass production, which was the earlier form, the earlier most advanced productive practice, influenced every part of the economy. Even agriculture was transformed on the model of industrial mass production. Now, this knowledge economy, this experimental innovative economy, in principle, should be susceptible to even more universal and rapid dissemination because it has no intrinsic connection to any particular section of production. But what happens in practice is the opposite. Not only does it remain confined, but it is over time becoming more confined through the logic that I described, that the, the owners of this, the, the people who are in control of this vanguard are, dis are discovering a way to retreat even further. That is, their enterprises are largely fabulous. They have no physical apparatus. They don't need to have their own labor force. It's just a kind of financial and creative center in which everything else is outsourced or delegated. And delegated then to parts of the world that then do the commoditized form of the same productive process. So is that necessary? Is that inevitable? So I think that's, that's the kind of question that arises in these progressive debates. So, or the question that I was asking before, does technology have to evolve in a way that just replaces labor, or can it also evolve in a way that enhances labor? Uh, and develop a 21st century counterpart to the 19th century practice of agricultural extension. The government organized family scale agriculture with entrepreneurial attributes in the form of a strategic partnership between government and the family farmer and cooperative competition among the family farmers. They pooled resources to achieve economies of scale while remaining independent proprietors and entrepreneurs. What was that? That was the invention of a different kind of market. In this case, an agricultural market that had never existed before in the whole world. And th that's what I'm saying is the kind of thing that would have to be done in spades in every, in every dimension of economic life. Now, that conception of what it means to be a progressive is radically different from the merely redistributive conception that what it means is to take on faith the established market order and then somehow to humanize the result. Uh, which can only be a, a, a losing event. And then I, I would add then a further comment, which has been a place to stop today's class. Say, in politics, the force, the political force that controls the agenda, that shapes the agenda, will always be the force that most credibly embodies the cause of creation, of innovation, of energy, of construction. The force that is simply attempting to humanize what the savage representatives of creation have done is on the losing side. But the losing side is the side of the progressives. So, uh, and so that goes back to this issue of not having a progressive approach to the supply side of the economy, a productivist approach. Democracy energizing democracy and democratizing productivism is the beginning of an alternative formula. Well, our time is up. I'll see you next week.
Around here. 